in Basel. So, oh. Yeah, in Basel. Yeah. So uh, my my life in Switzerland was confined to Basel. So I, I came to do PhD in FMI. I worked with uh, Yurik Pashkowski, Jerzy Pashkowski, who moved to later on in Geneva. Um, yeah, he was my neighbor here. Yeah. So in 2003, I went to uh, ZMBH uh, to Renato in Heidelberg. And then I brought Renato back to Basel, where he originally belonged. <laughs> yeah, he's so, just he's just retired now. I went to his yeah, yeah. retirement. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was wonderful to work with him. Uh, such a wonderful mentor. Uh, yeah. And yeah, and then in 2009 I left in uh, Switzerland and I came back to Pakistan. Uh, so here at this place where I established this department from scratch. Yeah, it's important. Yeah, no, it, it's it's very uh, reassuring and very satisfying, you know, to see uh, next generation of uh, these these students. Uh, we always had, you know, lack of uh, good faculty here in Pakistan in these areas, and now I see uh, we have nearly hundred students who are graduated from this department, and they are sitting in us in germany in in uh, switzerland uh, i think i think one is in eth doing phd so are, are, they mostly, are they mostly coming from lahore or or coming from other cities in pakistan no they are they are mixed, uh, they're mixed. So, yeah they are, so we have like 50 percent of student body in our university is from lahore but rest of the 50 are from all over pakistan and uh, university also has a program in which they fully fund uh, studies of students who are on merit but cannot afford the tuition fee and uh, accommodation on campus because this is a private campus and uh, so this the, this is fund, <clears throat> funded through philanthropy and uh, trustees of the university they are uh, industrialist uh but they are too much into education then they want to you know uh, they have invested last 30 years into education and this university has contributed a lot in producing uh, business managers <clears throat> this school of science and engineering where we are sitting this is a new venture this is the latest one they started in 2008 uh, and uh, we have chemistry we have physics we have mathematics computer science so it's a we call this no boundaries philosophy. This school is, uh, so we encourage students to take uh, in first one year, they take courses in maths, uh, physics, chemistry, the fundamentals. Uh, I always used to run away from math, but. Uh, Me too. <laughs> <laughs> but what I see that uh, our undergrads, uh, quite a few of them have dared to go in uh, computational biology. They took cell and molecular biology, but then they did their senior projects or thesis, BS thesis in uh, computational biology, bioinformatics. Mm -hmm. And they won fully funded PhDs in, uh, you know, US uh, in bioinformatics. Yeah, and yeah. Biology. Um, yeah, we have the same uh, pathway in, in Lausanne, you know, at the ETH Lausanne with the first two years, student in life science, they almost don't do any life science, in fact. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult. It's math, physics, chemistry, informatics programming and um but when they come to the lab uh, for the master uh, they i must say they are um, they're good they, they you know they know how to how to think and um sometimes they are a little bit short in concept but i think it's you know it's a choice you 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 must take either you know how to program things and make models and so on or you go into philosophical concept and but having both is i find is a is difficult, in fact, and um, and I'm afraid with a sort of a wave of uh, you know teaching student to become a, um, quantitative scientists, which is very good, you know, and informaticians and so on. Perhaps we're going to lose also a little bit of a more uh, you know historical and uh, epistemological um, side of it. So um, it yeah it, it's 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 complicated. It's to make a good cursus is complicated. Agreed. Yeah, uh, but for you know, for the ETH uh, Lausanne Zurich, these are federal school. This is to produce the engineers in uh, Switzerland. That's the we have no other school to produce people. You know, building bridges and stuff like this. So, so we need these cursus. Uh, you know, uh, 
I don't know if you have other schools in, um, in Pakistan, which are the equivalent of sort of a high engineer schools to produce the, you know, the people you need for, you know, organizing, organizing things, not biologists, you know, organizing. Yeah, things. yeah, we, we have a dedicated engineering universities, we call them. So in all uh, the capitals of provinces, so Pakistan comprises of five provinces. So in, in one, one major government uh, university like Eteha, it's not as great and the quality as Eteha is, but uh, in Karachi, there are a couple uh, engineering universities, then in Lahore, uh, then in Texla. So in last 20 years, we have seen really, mm -hmm. then in uh, uh, there's one uh, Ghulam Esah Khan in, uh, University, then National University for Science and Technology in Islamabad. So in last 20 years, many universities came up, uh, but the real great. historic ones, engineering universities are in Lahore, Texla, Karachi, mm -hmm. the major But do they, do they also get a, a minimal of uh, courses on life science, just to have a sort of a broad idea, you know, of uh, what, uh, what it is? No. And no. so this is where the paradigm shift came in when uh, this school was established where we are setting school of science and engineering. So because we have the engineering education in Pakistan is uh, regulated by Pakistan engineering council. They tell which courses, which areas to, to be, uh, you know, uh, included in the curriculum and syllabi. So uh, this school where we are now, it brought in this concept of, you know, having life sciences, chemistry and basic sciences as core component of engineering. So mm -hmm. we have now chemical engineers and electrical engineering. Uh, two majors are being offered by this school. And both of these uh, specializations in engineers, uh, engineering, uh, they must take basic sciences, chemistry, life sciences, uh, physics, uh, maths, computer science, etc. And now based on our uh, work in last 10 years now the engineering council has uh, brought in you know a biology course for other engineers they are recommending they have started recommending initially we faced a huge uh, resistance yeah so i i can introduce you and, and then we uh, start it's it's five minutes pa past two here so uh, Abdullah, we have everyone or people are still joining? Yeah, I can see still coming in. Okay, so I can start introducing Professor Dubul. So it's a, a real player and that we have Professor Dennis Dubul uh, with us. He is currently the Professor of Developmental Genetics and Genomics at EPFL uh, Lausanne in the Department of Genetics and Evolution uh, at the University of Geneva. Uh, Professor Dubul obtained his PhD from the University of Geneva in 1984. Uh, then he moved to University of Strasbourg for his postdoc uh, with Professor Pierre Chabin. I hope I'm pronouncing rightly. Uh, in 1988, he became a group leader at the uh, AMBEL in Heidelberg, European Molecular Biology Lab in he Heidelberg. In 1992, he received tenure at the University of Geneva where he is still today. Uh, since 2001, he is also the director of Swiss National Research Center, uh, Frontiers in Genetics. And since 2017, uh, he is professor at the College de France. Uh, professor de Boulle's research uh, actually contributed enormously uh, in the role of Hox genes, uh, which is a group of genes involved in the formation of body plan. Uh, and in particular, his work uh, focused on limb development. In vertebrates. In 2012, uh, Professor de Boulle was elected as <clears throat> member of National Academy of Sciences as a foreign member. He is also a fellow of Royal Society uh, UK and uh, he is very well recognized all over the world uh, by several awards and prizes uh, recognizing his work and contribution in life sciences. He'll talk about Hox gene regulation in embryos and pseudo embryos. Uh, thank you very much, Dennis, for joining us. It's a real pleasure and an honor for us to have uh, you in Pakistan today. Oh, thank you so much, uh, 
Tariq, it, it's a pleasure for me. It's really a pleasure for me. Um, it's the first time I'm e-visiting Pakistan. I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to visit, but that that's where we are, in fact, and it's it's a great chance anyway. Yes. Yeah, so I'd like to tell you about oxygen regulation. Um, it's not. Um, it it wasn't totally easy for me to, you know, to adapt to because uh, as usual, I'm I'm not completely aware of what is the background of people so I've, if it's too complicated just you know wave your hands and and uh, I I um, try to be to go more into the details or whatever um so I'd like to tell you about hox genes and let me spend a few minutes to give you a very um, superficial introduction on this gene family but uh, m most importantly to what we have been interested to try to understand. What is the question we have tried to understand? Now, this is a, a very interesting family of gene. We have 39, as many mam all mammals and many vertebrates, we have 39 half genes. And the genes are um, used to code for proteins that organize our body plan. These are, for example, the proteins that tell a vertebrae that it should make a pair of ribs so it is a thoracic vertebrae or that um, a vertebrae which is more posterior like a lumbar vertebrae should not make a pair of ribs etc so it's a sort of a general architecture of the body now the reason why we've been interested by this gene family uh, ever since we actually discovered this property uh, that was in the uh, the late uh, 80s is because the genes are clustered at four different loci in the human genome and in the mouse genome. And we refer to this as Hox A, B, C, and D. But the interesting thing is that the, the, the place where the genes are in these clusters do fix the position where they are expressed. And this is what you see in this little scheme here. You see, for example, that gene number one here is expressed at the very anterior part of the developing body. And gen, gene number two, gene number three, gene number six, gene number 11, and gene number 13 is expressed at the very end of the developing body. So there is a correspondence between the topology of the gene, the position of the genes, and the position where the genes are expressed. It's something that, that is very intriguing, in fact. It's unique to this gene family. Now, soon after we realized um, this correspondence, it turned out that another correspondence might be responsible for this, which is that the timing of activation is also depending on the position of the genes in the cluster. Gene number one is activated first, and this is at the very onset of gastrulation. And then gene number 13 comes about two and a half, three days later, so it takes about let's say three days to activate the entire family of Hox genes from gene number one to gene number 13. Now, of course, this is not unexpected because as you know, the, the, the vertebrate body develop according to an anterior to posterior temporal delay, okay? We first make anterior and we add posterior part. And therefore, as you know, along with adding more posterior part, we need to genetically tell this part that they are posterior and therefore these Hox genes are activate one after the other. So let me show you an example. This is a picture. What you see here is the earliest time of activation for one of these cluster. And you see that the gene number one on the right is activated at this you know, E7, very complex, uh, very early embryo at the start of gastrulation. And then gene number eight, gene number nine at E8.5. And you see gene number 12 and 13, the last one, they, they are becoming, uh, get activated at the very posterior tip of the embryo when it terminates gastrulation in the tail butt. Okay, so there's this wave of uh, gastrulation going on. How does that work? We refer to this as the Hox clock, you know, this mechanism that activates the genes one after the other. How does it work? What, what is the mechanism for this activation? Well, we've tried to understand this for literally 25 years, 30 years. And to do that, we constructed, I think the largest uh, allelic series of mutation in the mouse 
um, playing around with chromosomes. And, you know, for example, if you take the gene number four and you place it at the position of gene number two in a mouse, then the question is, will it be activated at the time of four or at the time of two? You see, this all this sort of a, um, uh, experiment. And after 20 years, we ended up with a model. And this may not be the correct model, but at least this is the model that can best accommodate all the data we have obtained. And we call this the, the rosary model for some reasons. And this model is this as follows. Early on, before the genes are activated, they are packed into a chromatin structure, a negative structure, which prevent the genes to be activated. This is for those of you, and in particular for Tariq, um, who knows about this uh, negative chromatin structure. This is actually covered by polycom marks, by 3-methyl-K27, et etc. et cetera. And then genes are progressively pulled out of this negative structure, one after the other, and they fall into this blue chromatin domain, which is a positive chromatin domain, okay? So the genes are sort of ex extruded from this negative domain, one after the other. Now, this model has several really good sides. The first one is that you don't need to play around with very complex upstream activating factors because what counts is the accessibility of the gene. So any, any kind of factors that will activate transcription can make it in fact, because the, the, the main factor is having or not having the gene accessible for transcription. The second point is that it secures the series of activation. By using this model, you always get gene number three activated before gene number four, because you pull them, you pull them out one after the other. And this is what you want, because if you activate gene number eight before gene number four, you will get you know, no ribs here, or you will get ribs at the wrong position. So that's not what you want. And finally, another point, which uh, uh, Tariq is well aware of, is that you can freeze the system at any body level. You can memorize the system. And therefore, everything that will derive from a given body level will keep the same combination of Hox genes because you simply freeze the system. Okay. Now, of course, there are two major problems to solve when uh, looking at this model. The first one is who is pulling? What is what is the force? You know, what is the the where, where does the energy come from? Okay, so who is pulling? What is the mechanism of pulling? And where does the energy of pulling comes from? Because you, you need to, to do this. Okay, so that brings me to about uh, eight to nine years ago, when um, due to a lot of new technological development, uh, mostly done by the lab of Jörg Tecker in, in Boston, people started to be able to look at, to see the chromatin structure sort of a in space by using a, a system called the chromosome conformation capture. And in fact, to make a long story short, because I suspect that you may um, be already aware of this, if you look at the genome and you ask which piece of DNA is in contact with, with other piece of DNA, it is genome wide. Um, it's a system of a, uh, um, uh, um, uh, you know, freezing interaction, restricting DNA, re-ligation and sequence. And you, what you obtain is this kind of pyramids you see here, okay? These pyramids are called TADs, so topologically associating domains. And what they show you is very simple, in fact. Within this pyramid here, there is a lot of interaction. It's a chromatin domain, okay? Within this big pyramid here, it's another chromatin domain with a lot of interaction. You see that within this domain, you get two subdomains here, two small pyramids. And again, these are, these are places where chromatin is in contact with chromatin, okay? But you see that between these two domains, between these two pyramids here, there is little contact. So it means that this is a technology that shows you where you get chromatin domains, okay? Now, if you look at the position of one of the Hox cluster, 
this is something we did right away when we started to see this technology. You see that it is positioned here exactly in between two of these pyramids, between two of these stats. Okay. Now, what makes the boundary, what, what makes it in the cluster that part of the cluster contact this stat and part of the cluster contacts this stat? And you see here below a chip seek analysis of a protein called CTCF, which is a protein that plays a, a very important role in building this chromatin structure by inducing very large loops along with the cohesin complex. Okay. Now you see that right at this position, that is between these two pyramids, there is the Hox cluster here. You see this series of 10 genes here. And look below, there's a huge number of CTCF peak. If you zoom in, you get the picture below here. In green, you see the Hox genes. And the red and the blue arrows indicate bound CTCF protein, sites where the CTCF protein is bound. Now, why do you see blue and, and red arrows? Because the CTCF protein binds its site in an asymmetric manner, depending if the site is like this or if the site is like that, okay? So in blue here, you see a group of CTCF sites with orientation towards gene number one on this side of the cluster. And right on the other side of the boundary here, you see a group of red CTCF sites, that is sites which have the opposite orientation. So they look towards the other direction, okay? So the idea is that these sites, they, they induce large loop on this side of the cluster, on the other side. We, this is the loops you see here, okay, within this side. And these sites here, they induce large loop on the opposite side in that type. Okay, and this is what creates the boundary. Okay, now, why do you need, why does the embryo need to have such a strong chromatin boundary? Because you see there's very little dots here, very little contact. Why does it need this boundary for proper development? Well, it, that's simple to understand. It's because you need to look at which kind of regulatory sequences you find in this tad here or in this tad here. So look at this one here. So this is on the side of Hox D1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay. You find limbs, intestinal, cecum, kidneys, testis, mammary gland, whisker pads, crest cells, whatever. Okay. Each time evolution had to find some you know easy easy transcription factors to deal with because the specificity is not very high it went to look for part of the hox system in this tad with enhancers in this tad now look at the other tad here which mostly regulate gene number 13 you find digit that is the end of the arms and you find genitals that is the end of the urogenitary system. How come? Well, because gene number 13, that's the end of the system. The function of the last Hox genes to be activated is to say, game over guys, we stop, okay? So imagine what would happen if gene number 13 would fall under the control of these enhancers here, the anterior enhancers, it would stop the body. So the entire logic of this system of Hox gene activation is in fact to prevent the last gene to be activated too early. Because if you do this, you stop the body, okay? And therefore it evolved this very strong chromatin boundary to prevent at any rate gene number 13 to be activated at a time it should not be activated. Now, 
let's have a quick look at the distribution of these CTCF sites. So I show you here again, the cluster with this blue side here, the red side here, and the chromatin boundary is right between 11 and 1213 here. Now look at the Hux B cluster, another one. Four sites here, six sites here, right between gene number nine and gene number 13. Look at the Hux A, four sites here, sites here, boundary between gene number 11, number 13. All, the, all four clusters actually have the same strategy. Now, you may know that these clusters appear, appeared at the root of vertebrates, that is several hundred million years ago, okay? And yet, they kept the same distribution of these CDCF binding sites, so, which really means that there must be a very strong selective pressure to keep the system on the four clusters. Now, the second thing I'd like to show you here is that, you see, it seems that you get a CTCF bound between all these genes. See here, 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 there, 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 there. And therefore we started to wonder if the position of these sites would not be used to, to help this time progression to occur. You know, a little bit like a snap, a snap button wind jack for the kids, you know, where you have this pressure button and you would, you would open it one after the other by exerting a force, tack, 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 okay? So some, something a little bit like this. So to verify this, um, oh, how would that happen? Let me just uh, mention, explain once more how that would happen. Um, a recent work by, by different labs, but I must say mostly by Leonid Mirny in, in, in the States has proposed what they call the loop extrusion model. And the loop extrusion model says that the cohesin molecule would land on a piece of DNA and the cohesin, molecule, the cohesin complex is able to extrude DNA. How? Because it is an ADP-based um, um, ADP, um, uh, motor, okay, it has a motor. And that could be the engine of the, of the model I was uh, showing you before. So you might imagine extruding DNA until it meets two CTCF that have an opposite orientation. And then it blocks the loop. So let's assume, for example, the cohesin would land in this part here. It would start to extrude DNA, as you see here, extrude DNA until it would meet this side here and another side on the other side, somewhere here, okay? And then after some time, it will go to this side, to that side, to this side, etc. So extruding one after the other, um, and thus implementing a time um, a mechanism. So to verify this, many years ago, we decided to mutate these uh, CTCF sites, to delete them. And we decided to go into a CIS approach, very time consuming, a lot of work, which was done by Leonardo Beccari and Benedict Mascrez. And the idea was to produce a mouse that has a mutant in this CTCF site, and then grow the mice, make a strain, come back and make a double mutant in cis, grow the mice, grow the strain, come back and make a triple mutant in cis, and a quadruple mutant, and a quintuple mutant in cis. Okay. Um, of course, you cannot make this mutation at the same time, the same shot. You need to go one after the other, so it's very time consuming. And then you cannot know if the mutation is correct before raising the mice to be able to make a cheap seek because you want to, to hit the minimal um, piece of DNA that prevents binding of CTCF, but that will not induce a, a mess in the, in the cluster. You want to keep the cluster as, you know, as native as it is, but with the mutation. Now, let me show you here the, the, the control work, which was done by Rita Amondio. This is a cheap seek on CTCF. This is the wild type here. This one, two, three, four, five sites before we reach the boundary. This is the single mutant, the double mutant, triple mutant. This is two uh, replicates of the quadruple mutant. And this is replicates of the quintuple mutant. It is important to run this control to make sure that you do not, you know, 
um, reveal sort of the hidden side or no, you see, you, you don't. It's very, very minor binding. You see, you can remove these four sides here. You still have this side, you can remove the five, you have this side. So it, it seems to be quite clean. Okay, so what do we do with this? Well, we started to analyze these mice. And these mice um, do not look very good. They have some problems. And let me show you one example of what we see, which is just what I'd like to tell you today. And this is an example I took by removing these two sides here. So the first two sides. So this is now a fetuses here. That is a wild type fetus here. And this fetus is homozygote for this double mutation, okay? Now you see that the gene that is right after these two sites is gene number nine. So now you have gene number nine that is close to eight, four, three, one. It's no, no longer separated by, with the CTC itself. And you see that gene number nine here, the expression of gene number nine is now very much like the expression of gene number one or two or three uh, one, three, or four. It's a sort of a mix, you see. For example, you see this here, this facial um, mesoderm, the whisker pads here, the gasoganglio here. You see the, 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 the boundary, the expression boundary here goes very high, which of course is not the case in, a, in um, the wild type case. So what it means is that when you remove these two CTC of sites, the expression domain becomes like that of one, three, and four. So therefore these two sites, they're used to organize the expression patterns at the proper body level. But what about the time? What about the timing? And we've looked very carefully and it turned out to be extremely complicated to have a convincing view of the timing issue. And the reason is uh, because I showed you before where these genes were activated. They're activated in a very small population in the posterior part of the embryo. And therefore it's very complicated to have enough cells and to see if indeed there is a difference in timing. So at this time we were a little bit um, disappointed by not being able to reach a clear conclusion on the timing, even though we could reach a clear conclusion on the space, on the spatial distribution. And at that time, I had a discussion with Alfonso Martinez Arias, who's an old friend of mine, a, a drosophila geneticist, who's now he's moved into stem cell biology. And he told us about this um, pseudo embryonic structure, which they had developed with David Turner in this uh, paper in uh, development in 2017, and which are um, derived from an aggregation of ESLs. So, what you do is you, you take about 300 ESLs three to 400 year cells. You um, accumulate them, make a small bowl, and then you treat them with a uh, Karen, which is an agonist of wind signaling. So you give wind signaling for 24 hours and then you let them go. That's it, you let them go. And you see that suddenly they start to elongate. A, a, they grow, they grow, they grow in a, in a way that is very um, similar to the elongation of the uh, body axis, in fact, the posterior part of the, the body axis. So what, what are these so-called gastrulae? This is how he referred to these um, pseudo embryos. Well, let me show you one piece of experiment that tells you pretty, pretty well what they are. And this is the work of uh, Alexandre Meran, a postdoc in the lab. And what Alexandre did was first on the left-hand side here, to take data set produced by this laboratory here. And this is data set for single cell RNA sequencing. And what you do, you, what you see in red here are all the clusters, all the cell type that you see when you sequence embryos from 6.5 days old to 8.5 years, it's all mixed, okay? It's every single uh, red point is a cell and you see the, the, these clusters indicate what, what kind of cell type, okay? On the right-hand side here is a data set that was produced by the lab of Olivier Pouquier, which is dissecting the most posterior parts. 
of the embryo at E9.5, okay? And what Alexon did was to map this data set on the top of these clusters. So what you see here in the right in red, in fact, is the clusters which are very posterior, posterior clusters, posterior cells, okay? And in the center of the slide, you see here's single cell sequencing of gastroloids at many different stages. And you see that all these cells in the gastrolate essentially map to these posterior clusters, okay? So the conclusion of this is that gastrolates are indeed posterior elongating part of the pseudo embryo. There's no brain, there's no head, there's nothing like this, okay? It's just the posterior elongating part. So this is exactly what we want to have to try and see if Hox genes are activated in these pseudo embryos. And then what uh, Alexandre did was to now cluster the different gastrolates at different stages. It's a clustering by stage. So you see, this is the gastrolate at 48 hours. You see, it's very homogeneous. Now at 72 hours, that is after wind treatment, you see you start to have a, a bit of different clusters and so on. This is 96 hours and this is 120 hours, okay? So now if you look at gene number, number one, you see that it's not expressed at 48 hours, but right after treatment with wind, it starts to be expressed at 72 hours. Gene number seven, it's not expressed at 72 hours, but it starts to be expressed at 96 hours. Hox, uh, gene number nine is weak at 96. Gene number 10 is not expressed at 96. It comes only at 120. And gene number 11 barely comes at 90. So you can see the, the time activation, in fact. It's perfectly respected in this gastrolate. And in fact, the distribution of the expression domain also is respected with you know, gene number 13 included into the domain of 11, included into the domain of nine, include, this sort of a Russian doll system that I showed you for the, for the embryo. Now, let me show you a, a, a little a video that was done by uh, Asin Rekaik, another postdoc in the lab, and what Asin did, just to give you a feeling of how these things are growing, in fact, was to introduce an M cherry into gene number nine, okay? So let me show you, you see, it starts to elongate here. It elongates, it elongates, it elongates, and there it comes. This is gene number nine that gets activated, okay? Very strong activation, you see. You see this boundary here? There's a rather clear boundary, which fits with the, the anterior posterior boundary of the gene. And you see here this sort of leaking, leakage towards the anterior part, which again is much, much like what we see in, uh, in the normal embryo. So yes, you can actually see these uh, time sequence in uh, gene activation. And you can even see it in mo much more detail. And this is the work of a Sinhaikaik, which made a 12 hour staging of these pseudo embryos, 72, 84, 96, 108, et cetera. And check here the acetylation of K27, the cheap seek, which is a chromatin mark that indicates activity transcription, okay, where, where the chromatin is active. And you see that early on, only gene number one, uh, gene number three are active, and then it comes here, and then it comes here, and then it starts going into here. You see this sort of transition, this, you can see this sort of wave of activation going through the, the, um, the, the cluster okay, so of acetylation. So yes, the Hox clock is observed in gastrolate. And we can actually see it much more clearly than in normal embryos and in a much higher percentage of cells. And this is of course very important because now we can start doing things with it. It provides an easy and somewhat rapid system to address question that requires lots of material, which of course we could never get in a mass embryo. So for the past three years, we have started to induce regulatory mutations, deletion, inversion, removing sites, turning sites around, et cetera, et cetera, in ES cells. And once you have your mutation in ES cells, which is quite easy in fact, then you can go and produce your gastroloid and see what is happening. And I'd like to show you an example now of this manipulation. 
And that has to do with the cluster, which is not the D, but the B cluster. Now the Hox B cluster is, is, is a very interesting cluster because you see that there is no gene between number nine and number 13. So the genes 10, 11, 12 have been lost during evolution, but the distance has not been lost between nine and 13. And the position of all these CDCL sites has not been lost. And therefore, we hypothesize that the reason why the cluster has kept the distance and the reason why it has kept all these CDCF sites is, as I said before, to prevent number 13 to come too early. Okay. Now, number B13 is the last Hox gene to be activated during our development in mouse and in human. What you see here is the activation of gene number nine. Okay, this is an embryo at E10, so very nice domain of number nine. But look, at the same stage, the little mate, you, you do not see a trace of B13. B13 will appear something like a few hours later in the very, very distal tip of the, the terminating gastrulating embryo. Okay, so Yoshka Zakani, a senior scientist in the lab, decided some years ago to remove in fact, this piece of DNA, to delete all these sites in one shot using CRISPR-Cas9 and to bring number 13 close to number nine. Okay, so what he did was to reconstruct a Hox gene cluster, but now gene number 13 is at an elusive position at gene number 10, in fact, but gene number 10 doesn't exist, B10 doesn't exist, but this is where B10 would be if, if a gene number 10 would exist. And if you do this, you see that immediately B13 is gained. There is a premature activation, which leads to an anterior gain of function. Now, even in this case, these are little mates, but you see that this one is much younger than this one, which happens often in, in, a, in a litter, in a mouse. You get sometimes something like half a day delay between the, the embryos. But you see, there's still no 13 in the wild tab here. It will come later. In this little mate with the deletion, you see that B13 now has been largely activated. So B13 is activated at a time where it should not and in a place where it should not. So what is the effect? Well, the effect is really clear. You can spot these mice, they are too short because they've been terminated too early, okay? So you see the tail is too short here. You can spot it in the litter. You can immediately see who is what, okay. But there are also problems in the, in, you know, in the lower thoracic region, in the lumbar region. So these mice are not good. They're lacking a lot of vertebrae because um, now the, the stop signal was given too early on and too anteriorly, okay. Now, is this really, the gain 13 that induces this effect. Because as I showed you, we've deleted this big piece of DNA. So you may say, well, you perhaps you have removed, you know, a, a, a non-coding transcript or whatever. And this, this is what is inducing the effect, okay. So to make absolutely sure that it was really the B13 protein, what Zakani did was to induce a secondary mutation on the top of the deletion, okay? So it, it killed the DNA binding domain of the B13 uh, protein. So what you have now is a mouse that activates the gene 13 too early, prematurely, produce a protein B13 too anteriorly, but the protein is not functional. It cannot bind DNA, okay? And you see that you immediately rescue the phenotype. You do, you do not rescue the phenotype to the length of the wild type animal, but you rescue the phenotype to the length of the loss of function animal, because this time you have killed B13. So that's the opposite effect. Instead of terminating too early, you terminate too late, and then you make more, you make longer tail, you make a longer animal. This is the classical loss of function of B13 here. 
And this is the rescued mouse, which of course looks like a loss of function of B of B13. So yes, the reason why the spacer, this big piece of DNA and all these CDCL sites are there is really to prevent B13 to be activated too early and too entailed. Now, what, it is, what is the cause? What is the proximal cause for this? Is it a simple distance effect? Do you need this 80 kilo base just, okay? Is it the presence of CDCF sites? Is it the orientation of the site? The number of the sites? Is there a repressive sequence, et cetera, et cetera. To address this question in, in mice would take another five years. Okay. Very long experiment. So then we decided to go into gastroloids. And uh, this is the work of Celia Beauchaton, it's a graduate student. And what Celia did in fact was to simply reproduce this deletion, the exact same guides for CRISPR. So the same deletion in ER cells, okay? And with these ER cells, she produced gastrolytes homozygote deletion, she produced gastrolate, and then she looked at the expression of 13. So what you see here is the control, is the expression of gene number nine. In the wild type gastrolate, you see this elongating part here, and in the mutant gastrolates, the deletion deleted gastrolates, and you see here the expression of B9, it's the same, no difference. And this is what you expect because number nine is before the deletion. Then she looked at the expression of 13, B13, and B13 in gastrolates at 120 hours is absolutely undetectable. It's like in the embryo, it comes much later, okay? However, in the mutant ER cells, she sees this blazing expression, 100% penetrant. It's a gain of expression. It's a gain of, it's a heterochronic expression. It's too early and it goes too anterior. Now, interestingly, if you take these uh, gastrolytes and single cell sequence them, okay, this is what you see. This colon is the wild type. This is B13 in the wild type, no positive cells. That's what I just showed you, no expression of B13 at 120 hours. Below here, you see the expression of Hox B9 in the wild type. On the left colon is the mutant the deletion. You see a similar expression of Hox B9 that in the wild type. And of course, you see the gain of expression of B13. But what is interesting is that if you look at the cellular level, in fact, you realize that the expression of B13 occurs in a subset of cells expressing B9. So it is like if you would have an elusive Hox B10, okay? And it shows you a feature of this cluster, which is very interesting, which is that the promoters are, are not very important. The key issue is where the gene is in the cluster, its respective position. If you bring number 13 at this position here, it will behave like a gene number 10, okay? That is be expressed a little bit after B9 and in a little bit less cells, but cells which have already expressed number nine. So is it due to a distance effect or is it due to the presence of CDCL sites? And this is the last piece of experiment I'd like to show you. And to answer this question, um, Celia decided to first produce a haploid locus. Now, why, what, what is it useful for? Well, she took ER cells and she induced a large deficiency, which you can see here, that removes the entire gene cluster, okay? So she ended up with an ER cell that is haploid for the gene cluster, only one copy. And this is of course extremely useful because after everything you do to the gene cluster, you know it happens in CIS, you know it happens in this particular copy that you have left. So what she did was using this haploid cell line to re-induce this short deletion that removes the CTCF sites between number 13 and number nine, just the, the deletion I had uh, uh, shown you. So she produced animal 
she produced, sorry, an ES cells that is on one chromosome haploid, lacking everything, and on the other chromosome, lacking this piece of DNA between number nine and number 13. That induces a gain of expression of 13. And what she decided to do was to reintroduce into this deletion here, a small cassette that contains the six CTCF sites only that had been removed, okay? This is to discriminate between a distance effect and or the presence of the CTCF sites. So what she did was to build this cassette with one CTCF site, 500 base pair, 500 base pair on each side, another CTCF site, 500 base pair, another CTCF site. There are six sites. It's a three kilo base large mini cassette. Okay. So now instead of having 80 kilo base distance with six CTCF sites, you have three kilo base distance with six CTCF sites. Now, interestingly, when she chipped as a control, to see if the sites would be recognized in this small cassette. She saw a distribution that is almost identical to the wild type distribution. So let me show you here. This, you see in green here, in green is the chip seek of these six CTCF sites. And you see that they have different sequences. And this one is strong. So strong, weak, strong, strong, weak, weak. Okay, strong, weak, Strong, strong, weak, weak. Now, when she mapped the chip seek of the um, recombined sequence onto a, a mutated genome, of course, she needs to reconstruct the genome to do this. Then this is the result she got. Strong, weak, strong, strong, weak, weak. This is on the three kilobase cassette, okay? So, which means that the, the topology of the sites is not very important. It's not very important to have these large distances between the sides to get the proper um, strength of binding of CTCF, in fact. It's really a, a question of sequence-specific recognition, we, we believe. If you, if you put all the six sides into this small cassette, they are actually recognized and they are bound with the same differences in affinities than they are in the normal configuration. Now, what happens in, in, in gastroloids that have this small cassette introduced between nine and 13. So this is what is happening with the HOXD9 as a control and HOXD9 in the wild type. I already showed you, it's throughout the posterior part. This is HOXD9 in the double deletion. So when you have get the large deletion here and the small deletion here, this is HOXD9 when you have only the large deletion, and this is OxD9 when you read through the cassette, it, it's always the same. OxD9 doesn't care about this cassette because again, it's located on this side of the deletion, okay? So this is a control experiment. Now let me show you what happens with the B13. Wild type B13, of course, no expression. I showed you this already several times. This is um, another control. It is one chromosome wild type and the haploid, the big deficiency. And of course, as expected, no expression at all of B13. This positive here, you see the panel here, this positive here is in fact the two deletions. So the deficiency here, haploid, plus this deletion. And I showed you already many times now that if you bring 13 close to nine, you get expression. Now, if you take the exact same configuration, but with this little cassette of CTCF sites in between, so now you have gene number eight, gene number nine, the little cassette here, and gene number 13, you see that you um, abolish completely the gained expression of 13. Now, to make absolutely sure that it was not due to a problem when we recombine this cassette, we may have touched the B13 transcription unit. I should mention that the Celia uh, Beauchaton uh, back sequenced uh, the genome, the entire uh, locus using a nanopore sequencing, really to make sure that the Hox B13 transcription unit had not been touched by this 
homologous recombination, which is the case. So from this, we conclude that when you introduce this little cassette with CDCF sites, this is enough to block the expression, the gain expression of HOXB13. So let me give you these few conclusions. First, it seems that uh, the CTCF sites are not, re, do not require any inter-site distance to properly insulate HOXB13 from the anterior regulation. You probably, if you introduce this cassette, it would be enough in vivo to see a block of B13. Now, the fact that we have now this uh, cassette inserted between number nine and number 13, will of course allow us to evaluate the quantitative requirement for this CTF side. And this is what we are actually doing these days. We can remove one side or two or three. We can invert one um, um, and see if we progressively gain, if one side is enough, if we need to, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, that will also allow us to map the presence of the cohesin subunit. And that may tell us about the dynamics of boundary formation in this system, in this recapitulated system that is very close to the real in vivo uh, situation. And finally, uh, this is a more general statement I wanted to make is that it seems that these gastroloids can be used as an analytical platform to address very complex questions related to gene regulation, not only to cell differentiation and to see how you, know, you can get different cell types and so on, but really to address question of long range gene regulation during actual extension that are of course extremely difficult to address by using uh, native mouse embryos. Now, of course, at this point, I should say um, something I mentioned in the beginning, which is that these gastroids are not pseudo embryos. They are pseudo posterior part of pseudo embryos. And of course, if you're interested in the development of the cortex or the entire brain, then you better try to find another system. So with this, I'd like to terminate. I'd like to repeat the name of the fantastic colleagues I'm working with, who've done the work, Osin, Rekaik, Celia Bechaton, Anne-Catherine, who is growing the gastroloids, Alexandre Meran, Chase Bald, postdocs, Lucille, who is a bioinformatician, and Rita Amandio, another postdoc in the lab, in this Lausanne laboratory, and in Geneva, Leonardo Beccari, who's now left the lab, Yoshka Zakani, and Benedict Mascrez, who is taking care of our mice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. Wonderful. Loved it. So, questions, ladies and gentlemen. Let's hear the grad students or. Don't be shy. Yeah. Uh, sir, I have a question if I can proceed. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Professor Dubul, for a very uh, nice talk. Um, so I'm a graduate student at LAMS. Uh, I was just wondering uh, by um, hearing you about the importance of CTCF binding sites and the cohesin uh, complexes that it, it puts the main uh, cell memory players like the polycom group and trithorax group to least important factors in regulating the um, Hox gene expression because this seems that they are no more important and it's just the CTCF binding sites and the distance which regulates the expression of Hox clusters. So um, I was wondering that uh, what's, the, um, uh, what's your assumption or uh, conclusion based on your studies and the polycom group, Trithorix group, yeah, yeah. maintaining the Hox. It's a very good uh, question. Uh, Najma, do, do I pronounce correctly? Najma? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a very good question, of course. I, you know, um, um, I, I did not talk about polycom because I, it was not the topic, but it still, it hasn't changed its importance because what, what I said before is that this negative structure that is first, which is delimited by the CTCF sites, in fact, is decorated with polycomb. But the, so the question, I think the, the question you ask, which is uh, of course the, uh, the, the 50 years old question in the polycomb field, which is the, the question of the causality, is, is it causing the repression yeah. or is it coming because there is a repression? 
And um, in the mass system, I must say, um, each time you have a gene that is switched off, then you see polycomb coming immediately. Okay. Um, if you do have a polycomb domain and you go through with transcription, polycomb is, is destroyed. It's removed very easily. In fact, it's very labile. We've done, uh, we've published a, a few work on this, you know, by having a transcription going through. So it is, uh, it is potentially um, possible that um, these CTCF sites are used to determine the size of the polycomb domain that is going backwards, backwards, backwards. So you don't get transcription because of, of this negative domain polycomb. And along with branching to new CTCF, you then discard uh, the polycomb mark. So I don't, I don't think it's, um, it's either one or the other. I think they may perfectly work uh, together in, in fact. Yeah, other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Attar. So, I can see a question from Attar. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Il y a longtemps que je pas parlé français, mais je vais essayer en anglais. Quand même. Um I was wondering between B9 and B13, uh, you deleted quite a big region. And actually you did it in and when you reinserted it CTCF, you did it in a haploid region. Knowing that CTCF actually is involved in um, uh, what we call it um, in, in, in oh, I forgot the name of this like male female uh, gene regulation. So, for example, like uh, inheritance genes. I, I forgot this technical term. But that in, imprinting? Imprinting. 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 Exactly. Sorry. Yes. Imprinting. So, knowing that this uh, CTCF is involved in imprinting as well. Is it a good idea to use a haploid phenotype just to detect CTCF? Firstly, this. Second, a small comment, I'm, I'm interested in more on HOXB4 and actually uh, on iPS cells, where we see that actually Hox gene clusters are more or less dysregulated when you make iPS cells. And in fact, it looks like that actually HOXB clusters or HOXB expression is, uh, it's, related to what actually cells you have derived it from. What is your comment on, uh, on, on uh, Hox cluster regulation in IPS? I mean, where do you think that it could take the field? Yeah, so to the first question, um, I, would, uh, I would argue with you on this. I, I don't think CTCF sites are particularly involved into imprinting. The point is that CTCF was discovered by Gary Felsenfeld at the time he was working with Shirley uh, Tillman on the IGR, um, on the H, you know, on a, a locus that is imprinted. And it was extremely difficult for them to make the difference between the imprinted region and the CTCF binding, in fact. So you, you're right, it, there is a link, uh, there may be a link between CTCF and imprinting, but it's not, for example, that you can guess those region imprinted by looking at CTCF. No, CTCF is everywhere, always, you know, with very little difference in patterns in, in males and, uh, and, and females. Um, so I don't think by using um, a haploid system, it will change. The, the question you may have liked to ask uh, perhaps was the question of uh, the, um, to have transchromosomal um, contact, which of course, um, you know, were defined by Lewis on the bithorax locus. Uh, uh, the transvection uh, uh, phenomenon, but we we've never ever seen this. I'm you know I've tried to see transvection in in the mouse for thirty years. Thirty years, there's no evidence whatsoever of transvection in the Hox cluster. Now, to your point on uh, iPS cells, it's very interesting. I I hadn't heard about this. I um, if you we ha we've tried iPS cells um, and uh, it works essentially like ES cells except that um, they often are more difficult to make, uh, it's often more difficult to make uh, gastrolate with iPS cells. Um, and uh, I don't think it would depend on what is the starting tissue. I think it depends on what is the strain um, of, of, of mice that, you know, the genetic background. Um, I'm, 
I must say, I cannot really answer your question. It's interesting, uh, uh, actually. I, I hadn't uh, noticed this, um, whether it is deregulated. Um, if you really go into a, a real IPS cells, I mean, a fully reprogrammed cells, I don't think it should make any difference. If it's fully, if it's well and fully reprogrammed, um, perhaps the work you're talking about um, maybe dealing with cells which are not entirely reprogrammed and therefore they, they, they keep a little bit of the hox information they had. But I, I don't know, I, I can't answer. Thank you very much. I see a question from Mohammed or for Hina. So there, is there other question or I, I should I, ask I, question? I, I request the student Hina to proceed uh, or, or I should. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Okay, Professor Dennis, thank you very much. I, I mean, I have two things to speak. The one is my comment and the other is my question. My comment is that your talk was wonderful and it was like a time machine for, for me and that exactly the reason why I ran away from working on CTCF as a epigenetic factor to control chromatin remodeling. So I chose a comparatively easier option at that time and that was uh, uh, working on CTCF as a transcription factor. So thank you very much for this wonderful and delightful uh, uh, talk. So my question is about uh, the deletion thing, uh, changing 80 kilobase pair region to three kilobase pair region, region, putting the same number of CTCF sites, six CTCF, CTCF sites on it. And, uh, and we, we saw in a wonderful experiment that it actually uh, able to do the job the presence of CTCF is actually blocks us the, the expression of Hoxy D13. But when we decrease the size of genome to that much extent, I mean, the DNA binding proteins, they do have other things to do at the same time. They are proteins, they are, they are occupying a particular portion of the genome. They are transcription factors as well. So what I do know, according to my experience, please do correct me if I'm wrong, at least for 1.5 kilo base pair distance, if the CTCF is present out there, it recruits depressive marks. So my, my little skepticism about that experiment is that, that putting uh, that many CTCF in three kilo base pair region is actually uh, create a very, I, I must say, a, a, a repressive state of uh, the DNA. So that might be the reason which actually blocking the expression of Fox D9, uh, other than what we are assuming that it is because of the boundary of the domains. Yes, yeah, you know, um, it might well be. I mean, uh, it's well taken. Um, the, the point is that with this cassette, I think we can investigate this because as I said, we can start modifying the cassette. We can start seeing, you know, if, um, if it is just a bulk repression because you accumulate transcription factors or whatever, or if by inverting sites or removing some, you can have see an effect. Um, there's, one, there's one thing that, um, of course, I did not mention, but because I, I think it's it's sort of obvious, in fact, which is that all these uh, chip seek experiment, uh, cut and run, whatever, um, chip mentation, so on, um, they're done on you know on a, at best on a hundred thousand cells. That is, no one knows if these peaks you see, if these six six CDCF sites are actually bound in the same cell. No one knows if you you know perhaps that you only need one to isolate and but but because you you absolutely want to make 100% proof the isolation you accumulate the site so if you don't take this one then the, another one can, can 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 take it so i'm not so sure that in fact you have all these proteins bound to the ctcf site and there are tricks that we can use now with the cassette to to see if you get binding because i agree with you um, as a you know as someone having worked with pierre chambon it is difficult for me to imagine how you could get six binding, six, six DCF protein binding to this small cassette. So I, I don't think that's the solution. Yeah. May I just want to add one thing? Because in, in my experience, I have found that uh, when I put, uh, when I uh, create a in vitro experiment, in an in vitro experiment, I have mutated the, the CTCF binding site, uh, 1.5 kilo base pair away from a gene. And luckily that is a Hox A10 gene. So the region was almost same. It is the same region we are talking about in the context of the gene. 
So it actually uh, allows the Hawks A10 to express a lot uh, by not allowing Hawks only the CTCF to bind at that position. And what I what I believe is that, and I found as well that it actually interfering with the RNA pole two system and other machinery as well. So that's my point that as a transcription factor, when we decrease the size, the transcription role of a protein becomes more stronger and more, I mean, uh, important. Could be. Yep. Yeah. Other questions? So I have a uh, question to ask. Uh, so when we think about this rosary model, uh, where you know this uh, Hox cluster is being pulled up. Um, if we try to visualize going from anterior to posterior excess, um, so what is actually inducing this? I mean, okay, we have CTCF uh, acting as you know insulator or sitting on boundary element, but what is actually going from anterior to posterior? Are these the Hox genes themselves somehow controlling? Like in flies, we know the posterior genes they repress the anterior ones and that's how they restrict their expression domain yeah. no um no you know the uh, i mean this is all old work but there's a major difference between the uh, fly uh, diptera dip, diptera and uh, and the uh, vertebrates in the sense that um diptera do not develop their body according to a temporal sequence in fact um, they make a, they make an empty, they make an empty space, and then they, they, they segment the space in in one shot. In fact, yeah. um, and we believe that this is why the cluster has been broken in deep terra, because you no longer need this time, uh, this Hox clock. You no longer need the time device because you use the uh, different kind of regulation with you know gap genes, gap genes which, by the way, do not exist in in vertebrates. Okay, we have no equivalent of, of gap genes. So these are different systems. Interestingly enough, if you look at um, um, short gem band development, like uh, grasshoppers or, okay, um, you see that they do have a, um, um, a cluster, in, in fact. Um, and if you look at uh, Drosophila, you see that the Bithorax cluster is much better organized than the antenna pedia cluster. Yeah. Much, much, much better organized, in fact. So to me, it means that it is currently being disorganized in, in fly. What we see in deep terra is the posterior part that is broken. In, you, I'm sure you remember that the breakpoint in fly can be different depending on which drosophila you're looking at. You know, yeah. it can be between uh, abdominal a and batteries, but it can also be between abdominal A, abdominal B, and, and so on. So it's currently being disorganized because you no longer need this pressure. Now in the mouse, all of this happens in NMP cells, in these few cells, which are the stem cells at the, the, the posterior part of the elongating embryos, okay? So in these cells, you, you, you go, you go, you go, you reproduce, reproduce, you divide, and then you implement this time mechanism. And then the cells divide, leave the zone, and go into mesoderm and into the neural tissues. Okay, so this is in these cells that it works. Now the question is, what is the driving force? What are the factors? And we think there are actually three factors that do the that do the work. There's the first one is a wind signaling. The second is probably something related to CDX, to a, a caudal-like uh, genes in, uh, in mammals, and then uh, members of the TGL beta. Uh, but I think the, the way I see the system working, in fact, is that uh, you start transcribing in the anterior part. As soon as you have transcription, you recruit uh, cohesin. Cohesin in our system is recruited by transcription. Okay, that's what we see. Uh, any place you see, um, any place you see uh, POL2 transcription, you see nipple B, so the loading factor of cohesin, that, that comes, okay. So you transcribe the anterior part, the first gene that is out, you bring the cohesin, cohesin starts to extrude and it goes to the CTCF, okay? And, this, and there we go, okay? You transcribe, you open, you transcribe. So I think that, you know, to kick, in, to kick in the system, you need transcription to start. And then as soon as you have a transcriptional activity, you recruit the a nipple B loading factor, cohesin, and you start pulling the stuff. That's how we. Thank you. That's how we see it. That, that this is now how it is. It is how we see it. In fact, yeah. Thank you. 
Are there other questions? Abdullah, is there any question on the Facebook because it was going live there? So I think Hina has a question. Hina was raising her hand for long. Hina, please go ahead. I sorry, I didn't see it. Hina has disappeared. Hina, are you there? Yes, sir. Am I audible? Uh, yeah, yeah, please oh, go ahead. Um, thank you so much, Professor, for such an informative talk. But uh, fortunately, the question that I want to ask is asked by Dr. Tariq already. Oh, okay. Well, sorry. <laughs> then that was a good question. Yeah, I had this exactly same question. So it's uh, I'm glad that do Dr. Tariq had asked it. Thank you okay. so much. Okay. Sorry, Hina, okay. I didn't see you were raising hand. So. It's okay, sir. <laughs> I'm glad. Okay. So if there are no more questions, let's thank uh, Professor Dubur. Thank you very much. It was really well, a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Really it, was cool it. To, it was very cool to see all of you in, in Pakistan. Take, take good care and be careful with, uh, with the virus. Be careful. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.